Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Johan Cruyff. First of all, the, the important thing to say is it's a huge pleasure for all of us that you've decided to come and share your wisdom, your knowledge about football this morning. We were going to start talking about youth development, but football is a game of improvisation, of creativity. And yesterday we had the Dortmund coach, Thomas Tuchel, here speaking very, very interestingly, challengingly. He's famous for having become Dortmund coach because of his successes with youth football. And he said, if I was to go back now, I wish I'd made it more difficult for the young players. I wish I'd made them play on bad pitches. I wish we'd taken away the bus driver sometimes, that we made the air conditioning in the dressing room not work. He said, maybe we're in danger of making things too simple for the kids that we're developing because of the brilliant facilities that we have. Given your background and your belief in street football and overcoming problems, do you understand the type of thing that Thomas was trying to communicate? Yes, and I, uh, I think the same way. Because, like I said, when we were young, we could play in the street. You can't play in the street anymore. But a lot of times with small children, I was playing in the parking lot. So what does that mean? It means that the surface is, uh, is bad. When you fall down, it hurts. So you try to learn not to fall down. Um, for small players, they quickly understand They've got to be technically much better than the other because if he's too slow, a big one will hit him over and he will be hurt. Of course, we had a lot of complaints of the mothers. We said, well, my child fall down. Well, the game of football is not to fall down. I mean, you mustn't fall down. So, or you've got to organize it one way or the other. So I always think that, uh, that uh, these sort of things help you to think the problem today is a lot of coaches are thinking for them. I always think that put a problem there and think about it or try to do something or try to... And as soon as you think or as soon as you do something you're not capable of or you, or you don't know, you're getting better. It's like you're right-footed, you learn to shoot with your left foot. Of course you make a mistake, but as soon as you control it, you learn a lot. If your right foot is good, you'd never be better. I recently spoke to Gary Neville, who's now an analyst on Sky Television, and he told me that more and more he sees high-level footballers who don't know how to solve problems. Yeah. They see somebody coming at them, the man goes past them or passes by them, and they don't have a way to interpret, to change and to improve. Do you see this as an increasing trend? Yeah, you see it, uh, you see it a lot if you try to look at it in a an, in an, in an coach way. So not as, as a public, but a coach. So you see, for instance, uh, yesterday I saw, no, Sunday, uh, I saw uh, Ericsson scored two goals from two free kicks. First of all, the commentator, I won't say he's useless, but it's got no sense what he said. And you've got to know what's going on. You've got to know what's, what, what is. So the first one, it always shoots with the right foot. The wall is there. As soon as you put the wall, the goalkeeper can't see the ball. So he will see him 10 yards later. And it's on his way. So he almost, he's got to do something before. So they left the first post open, which I think it's the shortest way. So you always got to close it. So he was standing more or less to the second post. The other one starts kicking, so he moves of course, because the big space is there, and the ball went just past him. But if you go this way, you can't get back. It's impossible. And that's what you see in the most of the times with all the defenders, and I'm talking about the defenders because you've got to defend well if you want to attack. You can't attack without a good defense, it's impossible. But you've got to know how to defend. So we know that the goalkeeper can protect five, five meters and a half, maybe six. But there's always one and a half meter where he can't, which he can't defend. So a defender, in my opinion, if some attacker has got a ball, has got to defend the corner, not the ball. He doesn't need to take the ball away. He must prevent it, it goes in. 
So if you know that the goalkeeper takes five yards, so let him shoot in this five yards, who cares? The goalkeeper's there to stop it. And if he can't stop it, well, we change the goalkeeper. But he's not allowed to come into my corner because I'm defending the corner. And if you see every weekend how many goals goes in, it's, it's unbelievable that nobody ever teach them these sort of things. And it's quite easy to teach. So we're talking about players being able to analyze solutions to overcome obstacles, right? And throughout your career, a recurring factor is you've rebelled, you've criticized, you've said, I see things differently. There's a contradiction in that we're a room, in a room of specialists who develop systems and who maybe could fall into the same trap of saying, players do it my way, and then taking away the capacity for the players to think. Do you think that systems in football, that structures, um, run the risk of killing intelligence, creativity, interpretation in footballers? That's one of the dangerous things, of course. It's very dangerous if a coach is too dominate to certain players. And on one side you understand because the coach always be valued of his team if he wins. If he's got a team who's losing, they said he's a bad coach. It's got nothing to do with it. It's a question to educate players. And educating players is what he knows, he knows. I mean, you don't need to teach him. What he doesn't know, he's got to know. He's got to teach him, tell him how to do it. And if he's got some habits, uh, which every player has, if you've got some habits which are not good for the team, let's say you're a very good outside player, very intelligent, you're very tactical, everything is perfect, but you don't defend properly in a proper way. So what I did is then this outside right put him one month as a right back and put the same outside right in front of him. So he will have the problem which he created himself is he does it. So that's it for a month. He starts complaining, and he's right. I said, that's exactly what you do. So if you don't want him to get into problems, do it properly. And it's not a question of running. It's just a question of brains, getting position, and you can do it walking. Do you still believe, as you have believed, or you often stated throughout your career, that perhaps the best guy to begin to train young, talented footballers is a, maybe not a coach, but a senior professional, a guy in the top team who has been intelligent, technical, and has the ability not only to tell young footballers how to develop, but to show them too. Well, first of all, I think he's got to produce it himself. Yes, he's still a player. So if you're still a player, you can train yourself. One of the fantastic examples which we, we had was Ruud Kroll, playing in the Dutch national team. He was first in a center defender, then he went to play left, left back but his left foot was not good enough. So the coach said, your left foot must be better. So what he did is that every day, 10 minutes before the training started, went along the side, sent a left foot, left foot. And I saw him doing it for months. Not one day, month, every day, every day, every day. And the, 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 the highest moment was when we played against Brazil, when he went along the side, got across with the left foot, I scored a goal. But that was just the job of working month and month on his left foot. And that's where you have to go to. So it's not a question of, um, he is great in this, so we forget the others. No. What he's got, he's got. I come from a country where sometimes in professional football, I spoke to a top level manager recently who was talking about Frank Lampard and how Frank did months and months and months of extra work on his own over and over again. This trainer told me that many of the other players sneered at him, laughed at him. Have you encountered this, that some people don't want to see players putting in extra effort to develop their skills? Well, sometimes they, 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 they're laughing about it or whatever, but you've got to know that the only thing what you get out is what you put in. And if you put 50% in, you get 50% out. If you put 100% in, you will get 100% out. It depends on quality, what is the 100%? But you will get the 100% out. And if somebody doesn't do it, it's impossible to put 50% in and get 100% out. It doesn't exist. But I'm also talking about a culture where some players 
won't want you to improve, won't want to give extra work, won't want to be shown up by the guy who's doing more to improve himself. Yeah, but at the other end, we know that uh, with 16, you're a great talent, and with 20, it's over. It's always afterwards what we could say, it had a value or not. You should have done more. Back on script, not to be provocative, but in modern football, where clubs increasingly find solutions in the transfer market, is an academy, is football base, una cantera, is it still relevant, is it necessary in every club, vital that they put resources into it, spend time in developing it, or are we in an era where clubs can say, we will buy our way to success? What's your view? Well, totally opposite, probably, uh, because as soon as uh, result and money are on the first place, you are on the wrong road. It's important, but it always should be second or third. So the philosophy is always, I think, demanding. Which means that uh, you can see it today. Things are going worse because every big club with a lot of money can buy 10 foreign players, or 12 or whatever. My vision is always that uh, if you are just allowed to have, let's say, five foreign players, first of all, these five you will buy very well focused, very well organized, very well done. That's to start with. Then you've got 15 players less, left. So probably it will be from your own club, about seven, eight players, something like that, youth development. Youth development is one of the most important things because there is, at that moment, a relationship between the fans, the public, and the youth players because they don't see him only when he's playing the first team, maybe they saw him playing in the second team, maybe in the youth, which means there is a relationship between the player, the club and the fans. And basically, if you do that in a proper way, if he gets there or not, you got an ambassador for your whole life. And that's what it's all about. The fans are working the whole week to enjoy themselves. So enjoy them. Don't say, no, we need to win. I mean, everybody likes to win. But at the end, if there's 20 teams playing, there's one champion. So there's a direct correlation, in your opinion, between the many, many years of Cantera work, youth development work, which began under you at Football Club Barcelona, and the fact that recently both Pep Guardiola and Tito Villanova were able to play teams that either had eight, nine, yep. or on a couple of occasions, 11 guys who'd come through the academy. Yep. There's a correlation between that strategy and philosophy and the type of football we saw under Guardiola Villanova, the quality, the trophies, and the way in which people enjoyed it, the way in which the world fell in love with the brand yep. of football, the trophies, that if you do it brilliantly and you have that much success, then it will be more attractive, it will be a better quality of football, and it will be more automatic, more instinctive. Is that a true proposition? It's a true pro proposition, but I think one of the most important things is the mentality of the country where you are. Um, if you if you got, uh, say, Spain, if you get the Basque people from Basque, from the north, these people are very, very happy if somebody gives 100%. And if he gives 100%, okay, he's got some failures, but he did whatever he could. If you play in Barcelona for Ajax, you can work the hell out of you. But if you lose or you don't do it well, they start whistling. So it's, it's a question of the mentality where you are. If you play in Italy, it's different than you play in Germany. And the people understand they should be satisfied. So you must always get a balance between one thing and the other. Your philosophy of football, the way you play, the way you buy players. So when I went to Barcelona in the beginning, I bought three bass players. There were already three, which means I had six. So I could train with 12 because six opponents. So you were 12 players you could to try with or to start with. And that's the most important thing, that if you analyze very good the mentality of the club, of the people, and your players, there's where your, let's say, work starts. Because you can't implement my mentality from Holland into England or Germany. It's impossible. So it's a question of seeing and putting yourself in the, 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 the way that the others think and then make the best out of it. 
Now, this is a nervous moment because I promised myself I would never, ever argue with Johan Cruyff. But I think what you demonstrated at the camp now is different from what you've just said. No. Because you implanted a mentality that the crowd in the camp now in 1988 and 89, they weren't ready for. They were impatient initially. They whistled that the ball would go forward in a British style more quickly. But you changed the entire mentality of the fans and the media with patience and with success. Yes. But if you analyze very good uh, Catalan mentality, uh, maybe because uh, Franco was there in the fr uh, before, or, or you never know why, but it was a lack of confidence. Like, I want to do something new, but what are you going to do when it fails? Well, we have a look when it fails. I mean, that's my idea, and we found out why I failed, and maybe I can change it, maybe not. Who cares? So you've got to do something. So it was not, not a question of, uh, just one thing or another. I think the biggest problem was confidence in yourself. Do whatever you have to do. And then, of course, your words are get, it getting heavier. At the moment, you get success, of course. But I think what, uh, what, what, what we changed there was the confidence of players, confidence of the people. I can remember that when the first time I've played there, uh, and our goalkeeper didn't get the ball correctly, but he put it down. Mm, everybody starts screaming and start crying and, 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 and negative in all ways of, 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 uh, of the way of thinking. And you had to change that because you never can win with doubt. You've got to be convinced. So you've got to convince the people. And basically that's the, 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 the work of a coach. The, work, the best work of a coach is his eyes. Sit down on the ball and have a look what everybody does. And give them individually these details, what you need. Let me go back on a point that you made so that we're clear. I think you said that perhaps a league like England might benefit from the restriction you had as a coach where there was a cap on the number of foreigners you could yeah. play. And you were saying specifically that some leagues will benefit if they're not allowed to play more than say four, five in their team yeah. who don't come from that country. Is, is that your argument? Yes, because if you look at the national teams, which it's the proud of, 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 of a whole, whole community, of a whole, whole country. I don't see any Spanish player playing in the biggest teams in the forward. So then in Barcelona or in, 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 in Madrid, there's no Spanish player playing. So how do you want the national team to win? So how can you be proud of the country when Nobody's playing there. And that's what you see every time more. I think in England it's just Rooney who's playing on the top, and the rest, where? Play a different game, different way of thinking, never in the top, never in Champions League. So how you wanted to win on, an, uh, on a European uh, Championship or World Championship? So I think the restriction is one of the best things. Probably I will be the only one, but that's the way I think. We talked about the Cantera, let me be specific too. You, you said not every philosophy will match the community in which you try to bring it to. But you're still a clear believer that if you have a football bus, if you have an academy with several levels of age, you must build a philosophy of play which fits with the first team. That It must be continuous, that the kids who are learning, yep. beginning 8, 10, 12, 15, 17, 18, up to the first team, it must be like one continuous cycle with the same idea, the same strategy, and a correlation of ideas between all the levels. This is still true for you? It's true, but let's say halfway. Because in the first place, you educate, you educate a person. So you always start with a person. He is unique because there's just one of them. Maybe he knows football, maybe he gets into the first team, but do you care about him? Do you give him education? 99.9% .9 of the clubs, they don't. Uh, do they help them financially? They come into a club, 16 years old, a talent, and in 20 years, it's over. Is somebody taking care about his, 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 his financial situation these four years? So when he's finished, he can, he's got something, he's got some sort of an education. We all know that it's a, it's a very dangerous situation for players who go too early to another country, and especially to a big club. Because if you're 20 years old, how you want to compete? 
with another very good player for 30 years old. Maybe one, maybe two players can do it. But where do they go? And I think the value of the person is totally underestimated in, in, in almost 80% of the, of, the, of the things. So all the things who are important, that as a person, you can be a, a very good player. But you see so many sad things. We did an, uh, some sort of an, uh, investigation in Brazil. Two years ago, I think it was, three, two or three years ago, that 80% of the players who lived the World Championship Cup are living below poverty. That's the truth. Not the one who earns a lot of money. That's the truth. So you see, wherever you go, you see these problems, and you should to solve these problems. There's no club who's taking care about the financial. There's no board club who takes care about any education. And I think that's one of the most important things. So you would have been a supporter of our colleague from Zenit St. Petersburg yesterday, who on this stage said that as they're building their academy, their number one goal is that anybody comes through that academy, whether they succeed as a first team player or not, goes out to the academy as a better, more rounded, more educated person, able to do well in society. Y you would back that objective as yeah. part of Zenit's academy. In general, I, I back it up completely because uh, the most important thing what a sporter is, is his character. Football player or whatsoever. So he's got this character, he's got this quality. So he can be used in all kinds of senses in the club. And that's a unique thing of a sportsman, is his character. And if you played on a high level, you've got so much experiences that almost, well, I don't know anybody who has got on a high level in a normal life has had these sort of experiences. If you just take one simple example, is that you play in a field, sometimes 100,000 people applaud, and sometimes they whistle. Then people from the past come, and when you win, everything is nice. But now answer him in one second if you lost. I mean, these are all qualities. And all these qualities, uh, I think, makes you a better person, or a person more, more complete. Let's try to be specific. In that manner of trying to build a person's character when they're young, yeah. to be able to cope with the difficulties that face them, what are some of the specific advices you would give to coaches in this room who are bringing guys and girls of talent, 14, 15, 16, what can they do specifically that you approve of, that you know succeeds? Probably two things. It's human that you always fall back on your quality. But if, you, if you're young and you want to learn, you've got to teach the difficulties he has, not the quality he has. So it's a confrontation directly with the person. They say, okay, you've got to learn what you don't know. I don't care what you know. What you know, you've got it. That's the first stage that the confrontation is there. And at the end, uh, you get better as a person, you get better as a player. So you emphasize the quality first? Of course the quality first, because you don't train where the quality is. You've got to train where not the quality is. And, and, and then the responsibilities. Uh, for instance, uh, when I was a coach, uh, and, and, and in the beginning, they would talk about corner kicks. So they said, coach, what do we have to do? I said, I don't care, as long as it doesn't go in. Your problem is it doesn't go in. If you go in too quick, too, too many times, you go out and put another one. So don't ask me how to defend. You have to defend. I don't know if you like to get out of the goal, if we get into the goal, I mean, it's up to you. And, and if you want to discuss it, take the second coach, take the, 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 the second goalkeeper. And if you want my opinion, I'll give you my opinion. But don't do what I say, do what you want to do. And that's the same thing with all the free kicks they take. I mean, there are 100,000 people that I've got to, from the side, I've got to shout what, what they've got to do. I, I can't make these decisions. I don't know who's feeling well, who doesn't feel well in the team at a certain moment. And in the training, I never ever saw what they were doing to create a free kick. Because it's not my problem, it's their problem. Their problem is to kick the ball in in the free kick. And then I had a question last time when, uh, when we scored with Barcelona the first uh, Champions League or the, the, the European Cup, where uh, Kuman shot the ball in. He said, well, how did you organize it? I said, I didn't know what they were going to do. I wasn't there. It's their job to do it. 
And the proof is that <clears throat> Stoichkov told me that the previous day, they did work on, on their own. Of course. And it, it seems to me you've come already all the way back to what we talked about Thomas Tuchel. Yeah. Give, rather than giving the players all the solutions, giving them everything, throw some of the responsibility yeah. to them, right? They play. It's their responsibility. Of course, at the end, I'm responsible for the people who are there. But if people don't take any risk, don't take any responsibility, I mean, they can't be in the team. Or they've got nothing to say. One of the things that I think we need to be most grateful for is that you created a belief system, an atmosphere, a culture at your club, both in your first team work, but also in the scouters, in the people who made decisions in the academy, whereby both first Pep Guardiola and then latterly Xavi said, if this hadn't been a cry club, we wouldn't have been picked, we wouldn't have survived, people wouldn't have had patience with us. Um, Carlos Naval, who went to yeah. scout Pep Guardiola, said he walks like Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. If any other scouting report came back with that, they would say, OK, send him to the movies. Why is it that more clubs, more people, don't see things the way that you do and say, talent first, character first, intelligence first, physique, size second? Why is that debate still going on? But like, like I said, you look at the person, you look at his qualities, and you look at his difficulties. So you name Guardiola. Guardiola technically was a great player, great vision. So it's, it was quite easy on that side. But he was in a position that he had to defend. He was playing in front of the, of the defense. So I said, can you, can you defend? So I let Romario or whatever, they were out playing him. So if I've got to myself, I'm not a defender too. But if, if I've got to defend all this blue, I'm a very bad defender. But when I've got to defend this table, I'm the best defender. So not a question of I'm a good or bad one, it's the size, it's the meters, what you've got to defend. So I said to Guardiola, football-wise, offensive life, pff, you're better than anybody. But sometimes we don't have the ball, you've got to defend. Your only job is to get the two other midfielders, one here, one there. You defend the table. You're one of the best defenders. So it's not a question of hitting somebody or, 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 or getting the ball or whatever, what we were talking about before with the defenders, no. It's the spot you've got to defend. So your only problem is, is not defending, is to get the two players here. And as long as you've got them here, you never get into trouble. That story ended well, if you look at Pep's intelligence as a footballer and a coach, but I still want to ask you again, I'm asking your opinion about other people, so yep. it's difficult, but if the proof of your work is in the greatness of your era and what came afterwards, the players who developed, the way that Spain played with the Barcelona influence and won so many trophies, why is it that so often people will still judge on height, power, speed, and not intelligence, technique? You must ask yourself why other people can't see the evidence and apply it. Well, the first place I think, and that's probably the most important thing, the most difficult thing, is to analyze the player. Because um, if you take the midfield, uh, Xavi, uh, Busquets and, 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 and Iniesta, the most simple ball, they will never lose. And if you see any other game, the most simple ball, they will lose. Which means that they've got never a mistake in their passing. In the simple thing. If you see the other teams, and, and, and I mean, good or bad is for me a big difference. So, I don't know, when I get the ball here, they said, well, it's good. No, for me it's bad, because it's got to come here. And this, this uh, quality, you could say, quality of all the players, because when the ball comes here, the ball comes here, I've got to control it with my right foot, I've got to turn around, I've got to look, and then I've got to play. But if you play it here, control my left foot, I've got the vision of everything, so I can speed up the game. And these balls had to be good. And Barcelona was lucky, or I won't say lucky, it's, it's, it's what their, their work. They did three types of players. And basically, if you say defenders, who could defend from all three of them? But they were great football players. And they knew very well that any other player under pressure, we'll lose a lot of ball. So the only thing is, the only thing is, 
the qualitative team is put it together a lot of a small space or very little space to the opponent and they will give you the ball because it's very difficult under pressure to put a, a good ball or you've got to be very good in technique they were so they could do it it wasn't you who scouted Iniesta, Xavi, Busquets, but it was your people. Yep. It was your disciples, people you'd put in place. Our colleague from Sporting Lisbon yesterday made me sit up and pay attention when during a discussion about systems and methodology, he said, but how do we pick? How do we scout young talent? What criteria do we use? How do we use our eyes? How how do you make sure that you put the best product into the system and then if the system is good or bad, the very best guys will always come through anyway? Help us, if you can, by saying, what are the criteria that under your system Barcelona used in the scouting to pick the young guys of talent? First of all, you start again with the person. Somebody can be shy and won't show himself, but could have the qualities. I remember that we, uh, we start with, uh, in Ajax, where I'm talking about ages ago, uh, we had an open day, a lot of people came there. Uh, I always took the first team to this day to let them think, let them have a look. Let them... So it's quite of education again. Uh, when a day like that, your, uh, your first team players are there, or, 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 or promising youth players. And then there was a player who played 10 minutes or 15 minutes and he touched one ball but he was always well organized well placed his positioning was perfect so at the end I said could he play football because I didn't know but his position play was so good that that if somebody ball he was always there where he should be we said well this is this is unbelievable what I see so I said well he didn't touch the ball, but let him come back. And let's have a look. If he does, if we play a small game, three against three, so he has to touch the ball. Well, it turned out he couldn't play at all. He had no idea. So he was always somewhere, but they won't give him the ball. But that's a nice thing about watching, that it's not a 100% thing. But it's looking at certain details where somebody loves the ball, likes the ball, passes the ball, uh, controls the ball. He's got individual qualities and a youth player and a football player, we always say it's one person. No, I mean, an outside right has got nothing to do with the midfield, nothing to do with the full back, nothing to do with whoever. So there's a lot of choices. And the developing of a player, 90% of my full backs, wherever I was in clubs, were, were before wingers. The only thing is they had to, let's say, uh, learn to defend a little. Because in my way of thinking, if we got the ball and if we are attacking, my full backs have got more players in front of them than the wingers from the other team. Which means that he should be technically good enough to do something with the ball with so many people on one half of the field. So it's a question of educating. So both full backs at the end in Barcelona. One I sent to, I think it was Tenerife or Las Palmas. And, uh, and uh, normally they ask the money to, 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 to give a player a loan. So I said, well, you've got to pay 100,000 euros. But every game he plays, 5,000 euros less. So I was secure that he's going to play 20, 20 games. But I was looking not to send him away, but to prepare him as a fullback. So he needed to play games. He needed to defend because it was not a big, a big team. So he came back and then he went into the first team and he stayed, uh, I don't know, until the national team, I think. We're talking about Chapi Ferrer, but he's one of the few players under your system that was loaned out and then successfully came back. One of the questions I wanted to ask yeah. was, how do youth divisions make the decision about keeping faith with the guy who's talented but slow to develop, or saying, we'll take him out of our system, we'll trust another club to give him first team experience, even though the other club might not have identical strategy to us. How do you make that decision to, to stay faith, to promote to the first team, or to loan? 
Well, I told uh, Chappie in this uh, Ferrari in this case. I said, well, as a fullback, a, f uh, a winger, you will never get into the first team. You've got a chance as a fullback. So I'm going to put you in a team where you've got to defend, because you've got to learn to defend. So it's again, you learn, you you loan out a player, and he's got to go to a team where he's got to learn where his deficit is. So if you've got a technically good player, but he's not very competitive competitive, don't play, put him in a good team. Put him in a bad team where he's got to work. So he's got to compete. And then he will learn, so then he could be worthful to come back and play. We started a little bit late, and I want to allow um, the chance for the audience to have some questions. Walter, is this the moment to go for questions, or do we have a little bit more time? Then if we have a little bit more time, then let's do two, three questions about the football that we wanted to know about. Then we will open the audience to questions to Johan. When we talk about, um, I, I like very much indeed something that you've made a principle of your, your teachings and it's been successful for you. Always taking a young kid out of his comfort zone. If he has talent, if he looks football ready, whether his size or his age says he's ready, you have always been somebody who says, promote him, challenge him in the same way, I suppose, as you wanted Chappie Ferrer yep. to be challenged. Again, for practical purposes, how do people make that decision about saying, this kid I'm going to move forward? What do you think about before you make that decision? Because there's a risk involved, I guess. No, I don't think it's a big risk. I think today it's much more difficult than it was in my time. Because today, if somebody is quite a good player, uh, the manager is there, the parents are there, uh, everybody thinks that the, 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 the golden boat is coming by, and uh, th that's a bigger problem. But it's secondary. If you want, you're interested in the player, you want him to, of course, you want him to go into the first team. So he's had to be quality-wise, mentally-wise, be prepared to go into the first team. My responsibility is the first team. When I see a lack of whatever in certain circumstances, he's got to do it. And if the manager, the parents, or whoever it was, uh, says no, he says, okay, bye-bye. You can't do it. Because it's not a, a, an, an institution where uh, everybody can do whatever they want. I mean, somebody is responsible, everybody in the line down is responsible and you've got to think in the same way. And of course, it's a lot of details who are always in the football. Because um, as a manager, uh, I'm very good in technique tactic. But I've got no idea about physical, not at all. So I never would be involved in physical. So when the first time I went to Barcelona, there was a physical coach, a very good one. And he said, what do I have to do? I said, I don't care. As long as they can play 90 minutes and they're laughing, for me it's perfect. If they can't play 90 minutes, you go out and put another one in. So don't ask me. Yeah, but who's in charge? I said, you're in charge because you're the physical coach. So tomorrow morning you start and I stay asleep and just have a look what you do. Don't ask me. It's your job, it's not my job. I've got to judge your job. But it's not mine, otherwise I get your salary if I do it. You mentioned two things that I want to pick up on there briefly. One, managing parents. Parents who think their son or daughter is going to be a world-class star. Or they want to interfere or they can't handle the pressure. Do you, have you seen special ways of, of thinking about that, providing for that? Well, I, I, if, if I've got to guess, I think 90% is like that. I know just a very, very, very few managers who said to a kid, a good player, 21 years, don't go. Stay two years longer. Develop yourself. I myself, I went to Barcelona when I was 26, 27. It's never too late. It's just a question to go on time and have an, enough luggage to defend yourself. But how can you go in a certain situation with one, 21 or 20 years? Year? You're not capable of defending yourself. Yeah, there's an exception with Messi and maybe two, one, two others. But 99% is impossible. So they, the clubs, and the manager and the parent should think about the quality and the possibility he has. No, they put money in the first place, and like I said before, if money and, 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 and winning is the most important things, 
forget it. Before we go to the questions, I want to talk about the Crife Courts that you've been investing in yep. all around the world, maybe over 200 of them in many different countries. Please explain to the audience who might not know about your way of giving football back to the community, why you're doing it, and, and how it's succeeding. Well, like we know uh, from the beginning, there's no way you can play in the street. There's no space, a lot of buildings. But the people has got to, to play, to, to enjoy themselves. So we created, one of the office created a small field, which is uh, two times and three times my number, which means 28, 42, and uh, put it in the most difficult uh, areas in any city. So I think there are 200. 10 or in, in, in 18 countries or something like that. Uh, there will always be a men's team and a girls' team, people. Uh, and what is probably the most important thing, it's not mine, but when I give it to them, it's theirs. They've got to take care about it. They've got to be responsible. So besides playing football, you create some sort of responsibility. And I've got to say that I was totally surprised how these people are. Because you think, they've got nothing, they will destroy it. No, they've got nothing and they're taking care about it because the only thing they have. So it's so surprising how children, they are, they are seeing it another way. And I just said it before, that when I was 60 years old, uh, we went to these sort of uh, fields and the mayor was there and, well, you know, everybody was there and they had a beautiful cake from uh, from Krijf courts and uh, we were in the middle and then somebody started to cut the cape and then a boy from 10 years, head backwards, came. He said, hey, professor, we're not allowed to eat on the field. So we looked at him and he said, you're right. So we went to the tribune and had the cake there. That's how they take care about their things. It's there, they've got nothing. So it's theirs. And you can create so many things out of it, which is, yeah, a pleasure. Football makes people happy, excited, and also proud and yep. self-respecting. <clears throat> it's an opportunity we can't miss. And there are microphones everywhere. If you want to put up your hand, I see one hand already. Graham behind you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Johan, when you came to Barcelona, you had to change the way players thought about the game. And players in particular like coming out of the comfort zone. So what helped you most? to get them out of there? Was it the repetition of, of drills and exercises? Was it a lot of talking to them or, or simply you had to get rid of them or a mixture of all? Well, first of all, my biggest experience before a coach to being a player there, which means you know exactly how they were thinking, the board of directors were thinking, people around were thinking. So when you come in as a coach, you've got a lot of luggage already. So when we came in, it was like uh, Barcelona was one of the biggest clubs, at, at, at least in the region, they never won anything. But then uh, you start with, like you said, analyzing the things, get people not in their comfort zone. Sometimes you get a player who's a great player, but uh, he, let's say it's difficult to convince him. The easiest way is to train with public, do an exercise where you know he's going to fail. And you don't have to say anything, the people start whistling. So that's the easiest way that if somebody doesn't want to listen, he will find out. So you can do it a good way, a good way doesn't work, you do it in a bad way. And, and that's how it is. If you want to get him further on, and you can, will, will have using him in a positive way, he's got to learn. And if he doesn't, well, some of these tricks are, uh, are, are quite easy. So a lot of people always are training behind bars and behind, I don't know what, there's no public allowed. I always love to train with public because you can use them in either way, or to applaud or to whistle to somebody. One of the, one of the things that have changed in Spain in the time that I've lived there is that every training session now in a senior team is closed. So this factor that you're talking about, maybe they want privacy, they want to maybe have secrecy about the strategies, but you believe that they're losing something by closing every session? Yeah, but I, I mean, today with all the technical things, you know everything about everything. And if you see the lineup, you know he is playing like that and he is playing like that. I mean, what, what, I, I, 
I never thought about these sort of things. Maybe because I've played in, uh, in, in a team or, or a coaching team like Barcelona, we, said, we want to play like that. And that's, I've been raised by Rinus, uh, Rinus Michaels. He says, okay, we like to play like that. And then, let's say before the game, he said, well, there could be difficulty there because he's very good. There are two options. You can change this or you can change that. Or if you see it different, do whatever you want. And that's how normally you give confidence to a player, in this case, to me. And then you start thinking, you start watching, you start looking. Does he well? Doesn't he well? He's got uh, some help. We need, to, we need to change or whatsoever. And I think, in general today, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, of uh, decision-making on the team. Explain that. Well, everybody, uh, if you see t today, the corner balls, they're, they're all the same. And I can't imagine that all the goalkeepers treat the same. So y you never see a change. Okay, you've got a set play, everybody knows, when you cut the ball. But how do you go against a set play from the other team? So how do you rule it? Corner ball, you could say, okay, everybody goes back. So their best people who can head are the, 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 the players who are playing in the back. So you could say, okay, I put three players who can't head, we put them up front. They've got to get three or four people out there. So you take a risk away. So I always say to all my, my, my players, if the, the other team is great in corner balls, there's one solution, don't have corner balls against. And if you don't have it against, there's no problem. In other words, I know it's exaggerating, but in other words, if you normally got five and you got two now, you reign 60%, only by thinking. And by dominating the ball. You don't give the corners away if you dominate the ball. So you must do any stupid things. So you train and you tell the people in this week or whatever, don't do this, don't do this. That's a preparation in my way of thinking. It's a terrible sadness, but I think we're running out of time. If there are no more questions from the floor, and Walter tells me that we have used up more than our hour, then it only remains to say thank you. And education, but also, as football should be, great fun. Ladies and gentlemen, Johan Cruyff. Thank you.